Can you hear through this? Yeah, you I should can. be. I can't. You can't hear anything? Nope. Nothing. Nothing at all. Hello. Hello. How about now? Hello, nothing. How many little Chinese check, kids check. do you think were forced to make that, huh? What? <laughs> well, if he's not going to wear his, wear those. Okay. I don't know why that jack's not working. That jack's off. That jack's <laughs> off. That was lazy. Oh, man. No, that was oh, good. Yeah. That was lazy. Too loud or good? Your voice is so smooth. Thank you. Oh, man. Do we do need to get Butter recruit someone who has, like, a the... very white style voice. Or an Isaac Hayes style voice or something. There's a guy in Newcastle that's doing stuff for Bob and Tom now. And, uh, yeah, that's good. Okay. And he's got, uh, he's going to do stuff for Boss Hog and Bob and Tom. And he, oh, nice. He, he goes up at the, at the studios. He's like, Good morning, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hello, children. <laughs> you almost sound like Rupert. Right. <laughs> uh, so I play Santa Claus on the circle uh -huh. uh, for the radio station at the Circle of Lights. And that's literally the impression that I do. The, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you, little girl. I was on Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta work up a flop sweat, though. <laughs> All right. Here Every time I've ever seen him talk, he's got like this big flop sweat <laughs> going on. Well, it's because he's always in like cargo shirts and a tie-dye t-shirt. And so when you saw him in the political days, he was in like two layers and he's like not used to it. Are we on camera too? Yeah. Where is it at? Right there. It's uh, yeah. on Facebook Live in the, in the Dear Leader's That's Court. a camera? Yeah. yeah. Only the fancy people can see us. Yeah. I think you're in the group. Facebook chat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I am. All right, here we go. <laughs> Welcome. To <laughs> oh, Creighton. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. Uh, I pick my nose a lot, Christopher Thomas. Uh, I <laughs> have uh, a nasal drip. I don't know where my afrin is. I have my. If you ever see me get up in the middle of a show, it's because I need a hit. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content and free stuff. Like free shows, like hours a week on that private RSS feed that only Patreon subscribers can get. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us uh, stories and news with the hashtags WALnews or WALpolitics, or in our group and Discord channel. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. We're going to talk about the government shutdown and FISA and uh, breaking news that Chris Galt was just reading me before the show about uh, the Mueller investigation. But Thursday shows that we record Tuesday evenings and Thursday evenings. Tuesday evenings are, are what are the headlines of the week? Thursdays are a little more of a deep dive and a little less serious. I cannot strain less serious enough <laughs> with this show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> when we are the uh, we have the original cast of We Are Libertarians for the first thirty forty episodes, it was myself, Chris Galt. How are you? Pretty great. And Creighton like Harrington. Always. Creighton, how are you? He looks like he's been keeping up on his muscles. <laughs> See, Creighton is uh, the least professional of all the co-hosts yeah. that we have. He's one of the smartest, if not the smartest. I would say James Neese and uh, Creighton Harrington are probably in the running for the two smartest co-hosts we had. I'd say Greg is definitely we should, there. We should do another uh, Fractions Reserve Banking episode. <laughs> well, we could tonight. No, you two, you two could, not that. you two could <laughs> no. not like could not have prepared less for this episode, which is so much like the old days. To fill in the time, he almost brought his guitar. <laughs> oh yeah, back in he black. He was going to sing his lullabies. I, I am in black. Back in black. <laughs> See, Creighton once brought. His electric guitar <laughs> oh, to man. a podcast. Galt, how annoyed was I? It, so you, you looked like you wanted to kill him. Because <laughs> I did. I was shredding it though. So you were having a great time. 
<laughs> Your favorite one. We were. It was after recording, so. Yeah. I see. I didn't. I, Everything good was after recording. Back I didn't then. know about <laughs> autism. So like now I see it clearly in young in young Creighton. I am. <laughs> I am a well put together young man. <laughs> You're very handsome. Uh, you, your hair, your hairline's not receding. Not yet. You got a nice beard. I need to. I need to. Road you, game. Here, you're gonna need to talk. <laughs> they can hear me. They don't yeah. care what I have to say at this point anyway. <sighs> See, so Creighton is the least professional. <laughs> 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 he sounds like a pessimist. <laughs> I I haven't said a single curse word yet. So. No, you haven't. <laughs> That's professional. I yeah. was wondering how many I was gonna count. Yeah, so, we're, we, I don't know, when was the last time the three of us, just the three of us, did an episode? Probably when he punched me. No, we did Try, one. Tried to punch me. We did one in between, didn't we? I think, well, yeah, no, there was, like, it we was did, a month we later. We did the Morty show. Well, yeah, but that, yeah, I'm but saying, that was all of us. just, just oh. us three, because after Chris left, Greg came in, and Greg replaced Galt. Wow, we haven't been in the same room together. We haven't, yeah, where is Greg? Uh, See, there's, <laughs> there's a weird tradition. There's a weird tradition on this podcast of co-host quitting. And, uh, some of them take that very seriously. Uh, Greg's doing great. Uh, actually, I uh, Greg is starting a new podcast, a new uh, website, a Thwart History. I think is it. I don't. I, I don't. It's a, uh, Buckley quote. Yep. So go check that out. Big surprise that he would name his podcast <laughs> after a Buckley quote. So, uh, but yes, he he carried on the tradition. Uh, he and Cat, and they're still together, and they're doing great. And uh, but Galt, you, you, you. <laughs> You're, I would say you're a conspiracy theorist. What? You guys always call me that. Uh, uh, all right. So how, what would you? How would you describe yourself? Huh? Uh, how would you describe yourself then? Uh, I'm open-minded. A person willing to believe in alternate facts. <laughs> I, I'm willing to consider alternate facts. So in March eighth, March eighth, two thousand twelve, <laughs> we are libertarians started with the three of us. I I knew Galt because he had worked on some campaigns with me. And uh, he he said, uh, I've got this smart friend who loves to talk. He'd be a good third. I said, bring him on over. I said, I did like to talk. It's nice to meet you, Clayton Harrison. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had no idea what his name was till the third episode. Yeah, Clayton. <laughs> and uh, we did one episode the week before, and I lost it. Mm -hmm. I didn't record it. Record it again. And then... Uh, yeah, you had to carry your entire computer into the recording room at that time. <laughs> like, you literally, I just did. imagine every time, like, he's got his office, and then we come to record, and he carries literally a PC tower into every, every, and this happened for, like, at least a month before you finally got something that could stay in the room. Yeah, the Zoom H2, finally. <laughs> so Creighton is a genius, and I'm a conspiracy theorist. That's what you see. I, I think you're a very smart person. Well, that's accurate. tell me why the lawyer... <laughs> The You're, lawyer. I, I consider you a very. I consider you a very stable genius. Tell me why the lawyer. <laughs> a very stable. Genius. It's a huge statement there. Uh, uh, so Galt, Galt, uh, Galt, and Creighton. So Galt wanted to talk. He started talking about fluoride and wanted to do a show about conspiracies. But here's the thing: like now, five, six years later. In the world where Alex Jones is mainstream and everybody's willing to... People, like, want us to talk about conspiracies now because they want to hear about Waco and the Unabomber. They wanted and, to hear about it before. Right, but... P polite you, I, society... I, I was, I, here's what I am. I was, I'm a progressive. I was still... You, you I was guys a normie. were behind I was me. a normie, yes. And now, now you're catching up. This is, this is the difference. At that time, <laughs> in our niche at that time, if we had gone down the route of having 9-11 Truth episodes... We would not be in the same basket that we're in right now. No, there. No, we would not. We're fighting for relevance and respectability at this. I point. I don't understand how a debate about an, a, one of the deadliest events in history would have See, this changed is anyone's it, mind. You guys would have defended the actual story. Somebody else may not have, but you would have won, right? Because that's the truth no. to you. So I don't understand how that would have swayed your audience or changed anything about your. We show. didn't really have an audience. If we had, so, right. we really only had thirty so people. So no, absolutely nothing would have changed. I used you would to, be exactly where you are right now with episode thirty-seven being the nine eleven. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't have been a big deal. See, this is why Gall got punched. <laughs> he didn't actually. So, I did not punch Gall. So Creighton was like, "I will not no, attach." You football tackled me. I didn't football tackle. <laughs> no, because 
No, boys. <laughs> I remember it very clearly. Uh, I okay. do too, because it's one of the funniest moments of my I life. I was there. <laughs> right. And uh, I stood up to break you two up, and then Galt swung the slowest punch I've ever seen in my life. It was in slow motion. It was, it was definitely a reluctant punch. <laughs> he was like, there was like, I as, he was, it more as he was swinging, he was going, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we we re we acted it out on uh, episode two hundred of uh, We Are Libertarians. So you can go back and listen, but but yeah, I then they got into a fight, and then Galt went into a dark room and felt remorse. C Creighton left in a huff, as he should, and Galt was like, "I'm really sorry, man." I'm like, "It's okay." And as they all left, I was like. This is the end of the podcast. Galt or Creighton is going to quit after this. And it only took three or four episodes for that to happen. <laughs> well, it wasn't me! I didn't quit. <laughs> well, you didn't quit. I fired you. Yeah. And thus the name Dear Leader was born. But you were being a bit of a pain in the ass. With my great ideas that you now would have loved, but back <laughs> then you just hated. <laughs> you see, Galt is a very insistent person. I love you because you are gung-ho. You are like, I have this idea, I want to execute this idea. And it's all it, about execution. Exactly right, but I want to execute you when I say I don't want to do that idea. <laughs> and you go, I want to execute that nonetheless. <laughs> so so I had to, uh, he forced a choice, he's like, listen, I'm, it's me or Creighton. I, I wouldn't have forced the choice if you would have let me post all those great Creighton memes I was making. At and the, they were fantastic, and I wish we had them in, in the catalog, and you wouldn't have deleted them, because they too. were great. But he was mad, and I was just trying to keep the group together. Uh, you were trying to keep Creighton you the, on your no, side. You let no. the, you, you took the chat out of the chat. That was, that's, that's, that, 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 that was what was over the line that for me. That is true. There, there's, uh... You can't take the wall chat out of the chat. I don't think I did that. You did do that. You did. Nope. Yeah, you did. You're fighting with Harry right now, aren't you? I think that's Jeremiah's rule. And I, <laughs> Jeremiah wasn't a part of it back then. That's right. So there was no... You do have seniority over Boss yeah, Hog. Just saying. If Creighton and Galt want to cancel Boss Hog of Liberty, they should be allowed to. We'll be expecting bribes <laughs> from around. <laughs> he doesn't even know the boss. I know, I know it's Jeremiah's He's like, what show, show is that? They're 40 shows in. He has a vague awareness. I know it's a show. <laughs> he, he Dude, I don't even listen to this it. show as much as I used to, man. Uh, you never listen to this show. So, well, you know, it's because I, I used to listen to it because I was there when right. it was recorded. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. It's like two hours of pop. I got other stuff to do. <laughs> so funny. Uh... You don't drive for at least two hours a day. No. It's quite easy for me. Where do you drive two hours? I mean, I drive all, all over the city. I, I mean, I sell business. Oh, that's right. right. So yeah, you're right. I'm driving everywhere. All over. Net South, west side, all my life. Net neutrality thoughts, go. Let's dive into some topics. Why? You know, why? I, okay. I love you. We can do this, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Net neutrality. Chris Galt. Great. You're that for it's it. gone. Great that it's gone. Woo! All right. So you, you draw a paycheck from one of these big internet companies. Yeah, the one that lobbied to get rid of it. Right. Yeah. You're all for it. Then. All for it. I got a thousand dollar bonus. Personal and selfishness. No. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't know. It thinks it's uh, the big, uh, big scary goat that the media and the internet has made you believe is, you know, going to end the internet. See, this is a. It's not. The this is a, still here today. Yeah, this is a retro <laughs> episode because yeah. if you go back and look at the first forty episodes of the show, you're going to. T t we're going to talk about FISA reauthorization of Section Seven Hundred Two. We talked about that back then. <laughs> we talked about it then. We're going to talk about net neutrality. Yep. Talked about it then. Government shutdown. Yep. SOPA. Remember SOPA? Rand Paul <laughs> filibusters. Yeah. It oh all, yeah. Now, unfortunately, that was this, then unfortunately, too. this one was a was a was a light filibuster, which is. Annoying because the the first one was like Mr. Smith goes to Washington style. Oh, it was great. Yeah, this one this one is a it's a fake filibuster. I mean, I was like, uh, this, I can't stop watching this. This is great. <laughs> now I didn't even know this last one happened. Yeah, I guess they got they got closure closure so quickly. Claire closure. McCaskill uh, shut it down. Sixty votes, closured it. Right. Full closure. Which I've had arguments on Reddit recently where they're talking about how. Republicans and FISA, and they want to spy on you. I'm like, there ain't 60 Republicans in the Senate. <laughs> Rand Paul was trying to filibuster that. Right. Yeah. All right, so 
Uh, let, let's let me ask this, Creighton. Are, uh, do you follow politics at all anymore? You used to work for Young Americans for Liberty. Yeah, and no, you were, I, I, you were in the swamp. I you were follow it. Yeah, I'm, I'm he was so deep in the swamp yeah. he put disclaimers on every episode. Right, go back yes. and listen to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I was. I mean, I you once once you have a Facebook news feed of a certain type, it's really hard to get rid of it. So. Right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> oh, don't worry, they're going to, whether you want them to or not. So it's, yeah, I keep up on everything. I, I mean... If it gets too bad, the only different... I'm waiting in Google Plus for you. <laughs> I'm waiting. Are you the, you're the only one there. Yeah, Google, <laughs> Google's the savior for that. Google, we're part of the hey, people. they that, haven't killed it off because they're just waiting. Listen. <laughs> Facebook that, will mess up. No, Facebook is already a blind space. I mean, I I'm so fit to be tied over YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm just I'm done with it all. Well, once Facebook's gone, it's not gonna be like oh well, it's a Google Plus is gonna take over. Even, once, right. even once Facebook doesn't gone, like Facebook. Yeah, I, well, but once once people like remove themselves from Facebook in mass, then it's gonna be like social media well, of that style is just not gonna be a thing. We're one of the people that got cut from the YouTube Partner Program. It's not like we ever made any money. I think we made twenty dollars off of YouTube ads, but it's the print principle of the thing. Uh, we have to get up to a thousand subscribers, so if you would go to YouTube and subscribe to We Are Libertarians, we post the video of every show. You can watch the show. Uh, you can see what Creighton looks like. You can see what Galt looks like. Ooh. Me. Uh, and, and you can find us on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, we also put the audio version up there for those of you uh, playing at home. And uh, yeah, WAL Politics also has a YouTube uh, feed. But these big companies, in the name of political correctness, really are doing everything they can to kill their to kill their brand. I mean, it started with it started with uh, Elaine Powell over at Reddit, and mm -hmm. Reddit. Oh yeah. Reddit really was the first to start sacrificing its subscriber base and its and its basically its agreement with users. To, hey, this is a platform for free speech. And then it became, this is a platform for free speech as long as it fits within the confines of a leftist worldview. Mm -hmm. And now Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are, are right there with them two years later. It's really disappointing. Yeah, all the Veritas stuff with Twitter coming out. Yeah, Pro the Project Veritas, we touched on that last episode, but basically mm -hmm. they came out and said, we're more than willing to help uh, them take down the president. Yeah. I mean, so I'm looking at it going, and I've, I've said this, I said this for months and now they're doing it. They're going to change the algorithm. People don't want to go on Facebook because they, they're tired of Trump. So what they're going to do is show you your friends and family again. And they're going to de-emphasize pages and move everybody over to tabs. And anything that's political, they'll just silence. And then, you know, for content creators like us, you, you probably want to see our stuff. Yeah. You probably want to see what I that's find... I liked it. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't like your stuff if I didn't want to see what reason has to say. And so they don't care about that. They're they're and what they'll eventually do is once that outrage grows stronger, they'll get a, they'll adopt partners. And so well if you want news, you can get news in your Facebook feed from the New York Times and we'll put this little box over here and there'll be a news widget and it'll be curated and we'll make sure that right voices are never there. It's, it's really, and I think all these different platforms are going that direction. I mean, you've seen it with YouTube. If you go to the news section, it's just their partners, like the New York Times video. And all those companies you named are the same companies that stood up for net neutrality, and, for and, an open and you know even playing field, it, and they're they're the ones controlling the playing field. It's exactly, and that's right. exactly why they wanted to keep it. Yeah, which I think is a very valid point because I. I, it's not like I like AT and T and Comcast. Right. Uh, I have AT and T. It's it's a very poor product that well, I have here. You would love Comcast. I would you, if you, you would could love it. Please, I would love you to go over to uh, my apartment complex and sell them some Comcast. I'll talk to him. Please. Yeah. So, Creighton, what do you think <laughs> about all this? I mean, I I feel like the audience of this show probably knows where. We're gonna fall on net neutrality, but I mean, they tuned the in FCC. because they wanted you to say it. I know, you all just want <laughs> af af affirmative voices here. No, I mean, I mean, it's. Uh, You've never been an affirmative voice. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a typical for for me. It's always been, even if there is a danger of 
Comcast or AT&T or whomever throttling internet because of whatever reason, to me, that's a lesser evil than giving the FCC the ability to control the infrastructure of the internet. Mm -hmm. Like, people think, oh, well, that's, they're not going to manage content, they're not going to do this, they're not going to do that, they're, they're just making sure that it's an even playing field. It's like, if you give the FCC, the government, control of the infrastructure of the internet, you give them control of the internet. Right. And, you know, maybe I am a little too paranoid, but you're giving the government control of something that has reshaped society, reshaped civilization in ways that are profound, un were not anticipated upon, you know, the arrival of the internet. And you're, you're basically saying, let's lock in a style of management of this system that exists today that may not work in the next... 15 years, 20 years. Maybe it won't, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe it will because it'll completely stifle innovation. Yeah, and so you're That's basically exact. you're basically telling all of these... these and, and to me, the, the, the big thing is that I think a lot of people don't like the idea of... They, they think of like throttling, like, oh, I, Comcast disagrees with this point of view, so they're going to throttle access to your website. And that's the big boogeyman that everyone's worried about. But what, it's in, what it will end up doing is mostly would have been... A, to prevent unique pricing schemes, uh, to to give people you know preferred access if they paid more for certain things than if they hadn't paid more, and all that stuff ends up going into the actual infrastructure itself to increase its you know how efficient it is, how wide it is, get access to new areas. <clears throat> I mean, these all these things cost money, yeah. and you can't get that if you don't have people paying for it. So if if you're going to prevent uh, infrastructures companies from being able to invest in their systems because they're not getting as much revenue than they otherwise could have, then you're just you're preventing the internet from growing at a rate that it could be growing. You're still going to have internet, but it's not going to be as as sophisticated as it otherwise could have been. We still have roads, but yeah. we know if we had private roads, they'd be a lot more innovative right now. Mm -hmm. So I want to read this comment because it, it isn't something. I mean. Go on our Facebook page and post one way on net neutrality, and it's just a s show. Uh, our Facebook page turns into a real. It's, it's surprising how how there is a there is a significant split within libertarian circles. Yes, yeah. because a lot of libertarians have bought into what EFF and and other tech outlets and companies like Facebook and Google are saying, as opposed to you know a voice like mine, which says I work in the radio industry. I've lived through the censorship of of Janet Jackson and knowing what you can and can't say. And it's important to point out that that was not originally in the FCC's mandate. It wasn't. When they were originally created, their job was to just make sure radio frequencies didn't overlap in that, specific areas. That you couldn't go, you know, we're on 94.7, that 95.5 can't jam the 94.7 right. signal without prosecution. The, the censorship came afterwards. It's just right. a, it's another example of mission creep that happens with any kind of bureaucracy. Exactly. So the FCC is not a free speech organization, and you're talking about the greatest tool of human speech, free speech, ever, and then you have these companies like Facebook, Google, and uh, Twitter succumbing to basically thought control and limiting speech on their platforms. Uh, so a friend got a 30-day ban for saying something that was, I mean, it, was, it wasn't anything that I found uh, inappropriate. I know I'm broken as a, as a person because I grew up on the internet, but I just, I sit there and I go, you know, as far as violating community guidelines, there's a lot of people in that person's community that wanted to see that. They thought that was funny. And it goes back to the community standards argument when they would, when they would rule against Howard Stern or Bubba the Love Sponge, and they'd say, well, this isn't in the community interest for Howard Stern to interview a naked woman. Well, in some of the communities, it is in some of the community's interest to hear that kind of speech. Like... Who is the FCC to rule on that or not? So it, it, it's a it's a case of I don't want to go fight my local and state governments, which would be easier for you to do than to fight the FCC. I promise you. Uh, so I'll just have the FCC fix it. Uh, Adam wrote in and uh, corrected me on something. Adam Nelson. Uh, so I figured it seems like a good time to write this and see if you guys disagree with this. Uh, hey, I listened to you on the most recent podcast on Bitcoin and net neutrality, and I feel like you had some information mixed up. Yes, the FCC's de decision to repeal net neutrality only repealed something that put in place in 2015, 
Remember the reason why those rules were put in place were, was because the FCC also ruled that year that internet providers were no longer considered telecommunication companies, removing the restriction that all landlines must carry phone provider signals regardless of the owner. That was following a 2005 ruling that Madison River must allow VOI VoIP service, phone calls over the internet, that was run by a computer to use their internet service. Um, also, as to internet companies owning the infrastructure for internet service in many regions, there are government enforced monopolies, according to, the, to this 2013 article. Yeah, we know there's monopolies at the local level. What I'm saying is go to your local government and get those monopolies repealed or replaced. It isn't that hard to write a bill or to go and pull up the various local ordinances that define that and write something to change it and then lobby to get that done. You can do that, and you can do that in a fairly short amount of time, create a local government that is uh, competitive, and bring in somebody like a Spectrum or a Metronet when you only have a Comcast and a Verizon, and then you make yourself a more attractive community. So the argument that I get from net neutrality proponents where, well, there's so many local, regu local and state regulations, I get that. Change it. It's don't add more. Don't add, add more. At a whole other layer. At a whole other level that is way more. You have five people. Three are Republicans, two are Democrats right now. And when the parties switch, it switch. These are people who are, are largely, they're political appointees, so they're subject to more corruption. They're not the, the these this council of gods that will save the internet. Do some work. Like, I'm, I'm, I get so tired of libertarians just... It, it's really like the net neutrality brings out a lot of statism tendency, status tendencies where you go, ah, it'll never change, so let's just have the federal government fix it. It's like, no. I mean, M Martin Luther King, as we discussed on the last episode, is a great example of somebody who organized a movement in local areas and changed local governments. And, and it wasn't until it was completely intractable at these local and state levels and you had those state and local governments violating the Constitution and the federal and state and their local laws that the the civil rights bill was passed and libertarians argue whether that was good or not um, but they were at least trying <laughs> instead of getting online and going I'm I'm upset <laughs> like go go it's not that hard to write a law <laughs> it really isn't and these laws that are these giant webs of generalization like that they just don't work. Right. If, if there is a problem, fix it at the local level then. I guarantee that right. everybody who goes online and says, oh, at the right. local level, uh, it, oh, we have all these rules at local and state level, it's right. monopolies. I like, ha, do you, have you read the law? But they're like, it's monopolized in this rural area here in random North Dakota. I'm like, then make, let North Dakota fix that. Right. That you, has nothing to do with New York City. It, it, <laughs> is, it is so much easier to make change at the local level than you realize. Because yeah. so few people... We've made change at local level. Yeah, we have, and, and Galt can attest to this. It's so few people actually care about their local government that nobody ever shows up to mm -hmm. it. And so when a citizen walks in a room with a video camera, they all go, oh, what is that? <laughs> Boss Hog of Liberty is basically setting their... The, what they're working on is setting a template for local uh, counties, uh, basically, to be a watchdog on local government and build a media outlet for nice. their local county. And then what we're going to do is... After a period of time where we feel, feel we've worked out the bugs, say, here's how we did it. Here's the guide to creating your own local media outlet that can change local government. And, uh, you know, they're now interviewing... We need to make We Are Libertarians chapters. Oh, well, that's kind of across what, the country. So that's kind of what we're working where on. people can organize and change local policy. You know, the best one of the best people I've ever seen organize a state? Who? This guy, right? Creighton yeah. Harrington. Creighton Harrington. Put you in charge. He the entire state of Indiana. Creighton but, seems nonplussed. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, and so Adam, Adam continues. <laughs> I, to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, I believe as a libertarian that net neutrality is a necessary evil until we can bar government from harming competition so that smaller ISPs and tech companies can remain as viable startups. <laughs> that's see, that's the, the fundamental problem with that is that it once a government policy, this... Frankly, the fact that net neutrality got repealed is beyond insanely rare. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Milton Friedman has quotes where it's like, there's nothing more permanent than a government program or something. Or maybe it was Reagan. And, and it's a joke, but it speaks to a truth. Like, 
you know, we're talking about, oh, well, we need to have net neutrality until, you know, these little ISPs can catch up. Like, if net neutrality exists and it's, like, a popular thing, it isn't just some... If it, it, if it becomes, like, a legal thing, like, if, if Congress passes the law to enforce net neutrality or something, it's gone. It's there forever. It's mm-hmm. never going to go away, no matter what. If, you know, the, if the, the, the sentiment changes, if, uh, IS, if little ISPs do catch up to big ISPs, it's still going to be there. Right. It locks in a style of management forever. And that's something I don't think people realize. Like, people are very short-term... Well, they don't have. They don't take a long term outlook with a lot of this stuff. They're like, there's a problem here that we could solve pretty quickly with this, and that's what I'm thinking about. But what about this and this and this and this along down the line? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't. Th- well, I mean, the, you know, right. that he say it could be anything, you know, and you, you know, you don't really realize it. It's like you don't know what the future brings. You mm-hmm. don't. You, you have no idea. You cannot anticipate the different styles of anything that will exist within internet infrastructure. Pricing schemes for internet, for mobile devices, for all that. You you just cannot see that. You don't. You're, no one is smart enough to know what's going to happen. So what you're saying is, let's lock in this specific one because I'm familiar with it. And as Ajit Pai basically said, there's been a five percent slowdown in innovation and expansion of broadband across the nation because they're dealing with more regulation because they have to go through the FCC to get a lot of stuff cleared. And so, you and let's not forget that the 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 this was passed in a time when basically every reason for passing it that was given by net neutrality advocates were like one case in you know millions. Like it it was very rare that anything that they said we needed net neutrality to stop actually was happening. Like prior to net neutrality, there was. You know, they argued we needed this to prevent this thing from happening and this thing from happening, but those things weren't happening. And then, obviously, they weren't happening when net neutrality was happening. Now, net, net neutrality, all we've done is move back to 2015 internet. Like, it's not like we've gone to, you know, the Gilded Age or something. It's, <laughs> it's literally 2015 internet when none of these problems were happening to begin with. Now, you could probably say, hey, here's an example of it happening and here's an example of it happening, but, like, I can give you, like, uh, outliers of any kind of statement, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that there's a general trend. And general trends are what should be legislated upon, not specific instances of you know some scary thing that may have happened one time and been a fluke. Well, it's also weird to see libertarians. You know, so much of the criticism of the Obama era was executive action was was too intense. And at the time, you go back and listen to the episode, we criticized this move because it's executive action where Congress should have acted. And these are libertarians sticking up for Obama executive action. And there's a lot of stuff that Trump is repealing that I see the li- people in the libertarian movement freaking out about. And if you probably went back to their post at that time, they were like, I don't trust Obama and his executive action. It's like, well, Trump's repealing that. It's like DACA is a great example of it. DACA is something, again, we talked about in those first 30 episodes, where it, it was. It, it's just been... an an executive can being kicked down the road. And Trump said, no, Congress needs to fix it. And now they're having trouble fixing it. They're kicking everything down. Uh, Or the weed memo. Yeah, go ahead. The weed memo. Obama should have have used his political capital to just legalize marijuana rather than just tell executive agencies, eh, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Because then what happens, Trump gets elected, puts the worst guy in possible and and, and charges the Department of Justice, and he says, that memo... Is gone, and right. now we're not going to we just let you get away it. with it. Right, and like you know, if you would have used some effort, like this is something that gets me in general is like a lot of these issues. Uh, Obama had a lot of political capital in his for in the, at the beginning of his uh, administration. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had a lot of political capital really throughout. But he really had a lot when they had the supermajority, and they used all of that to do health health care. But he didn't really put any effort into any other things that could have been let. You know, there isn't arguably there was a chance that marijuana could have been legalized at least medically on the federal level yeah. during that early administration. And he and liberals put no emphasis on it it's because they don't prioritize it mm-hmm. as much as they'd like to say they do. But instead, he said, "Well, I'm just going to make an executive action, make a memo." And then what happens? Tries like. You, you know, you give this, you have an executive action, then you can either undo it or they can, you know, the next president has the same power. And, you know, the worst guy imaginable to the left got elected. 
And what does he do? Exactly what we said he would do. It's really like it's really hard to understand what Obama did. <laughs> you know, he had. You're right. Looking back, I can remember the end of Clinton and the end of Bush and the end of Obama. Well, Clinton had good approval ratings, but the Lewinsky scandal and the impeachment completely sapped all of his his abilities. Bush was a pariah. I mean, right. nobody nobody that, liked George that, Bush. That that uh, that financial crisis hit at the perfect moment. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Obama, uh, he he at the end, I think he especially. That last year where it looks like Trump could be a presidential uh, option, everybody was like, no, 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 let's keep Obama. At yeah. least he's not going to do anything. <laughs> you know? Like, even I was like, uh, I don't know, do we, uh, they're both going to add trillions to the debt, at least this one's nice. Um, but uh, it, it, he did squander, especially in that area, but it is interesting as we kind of reflect, like, looking back years it's like the conspiracy thing. So much of what we talked about in 2012, things, it, it, it's almost like things don't matter as much now. Like, things were much more, much more intense and much more, like, and I don't know if it's because we were, I was a normie. <laughs> you know, we were normies. We hadn't seen the uh, famous 4chan meme of the grandmother that shall go remain unnamed. Like, that, that, that that was your deflowering? That yes, was... <laughs> yes. Uh, it just seems like in politics and in political conversation, we're much more comfortable with a lot of stuff. It's like the brink of nuclear war will do that. You have to be now. Like, yeah, our like, lives are cartoons now. Right. Like, there's, <laughs> like, the, like, what was considered, like, normal and respectable is now just out the window. Like, right. And then the left is saying, well, let's have Oprah run. Like, right. Like, it literally is a sense uh, that our life is a sense of Hawaii was hit by a missile. <laughs> yeah. Everybody believed it for like an hour, too. All right, maybe <laughs> the whole world. People were like, Hawaii's memes. gone. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> Rest in peace, Hawaii. That'll happen in the Trump age. <laughs> like, we're just going to lose a state. It's true. Like, <laughs> it, it, no, but California's splitting up. You heard that? I know. I'm so saying. they'll add it back in. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I, it just On one level, I'm kind of okay with it. Like, people recognizing a lot of what government <laughs> is as you know, kind of farcical, mm -hmm. and it now there's no, there's no way around it, you know, you, you look at it and you're like, this is a circus, right? when at least beforehand it was like a respectable circus, right? they could at least put on a good show, and you wouldn't notice that it's actually just a bunch of people on trapezes, um, but, but now you can't get away with that, like everyone's like, it is a circus, like there's people out there trying to make it be, still be respectable, but you know, the immediate response is some, you know, dude in the back of his pickup truck with a mullet saying, hey, Trump, if, if you want an illustration to that, there is no better illustration of us not taking politics seriously anymore. Like the fact that Alex Jones now has become a credible news source. Right, I mean, it's In insane. so many ways. Because, like, he's taken seriously because it, it, four or five years ago, he was a joke. Now people watch him and take him seriously because the president has broken so many norms. And people have always taken him seriously. I, I know they have, no. but... People have always taken him seriously. And there are a place in the media for people like Alex Jones. And that is the, that is the foundation and the bedrock of a free press, is to have people like that. that I agree. People like we can look at and decide for ourselves what I, he's saying. I, I have I, decided that he's a nutcase. I spend a couple hours a week with Alex. I, I love Alex. I showed, uh, I sh I, my friend Michelle was over last night, and I showed her Gay Frogs. She had never watched a second of Alex Jones, and I go, well, we're watching Gay Frogs then. <laughs> we're, having, he, we're having an Alex Jones party. Bring your juicy <laughs> juice! <laughs> She's a social worker and a super, you know, progressive, and uh, basically, <laughs> two years ago, Tad Western called Africa a shithole, and she about punched him, and it was, because <laughs> she was so outraged by it. Now she's just like... Whatever. That's just politics now. Like, it, it is. It's just people's Overton window has just shifted wow. so far that Alex Jones looks like a serious member of the media. And it, 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 what it's, it, what's insane to me is how 90, I don't know, like maybe, we may, we'll find out. Maybe after Trump, people have kind of gotten sick of him. Maybe he doesn't get reelected. Maybe he doesn't, I don't know. I couldn't say left or right on that. But, like, maybe it'll shift back to, where, like, remember, the, remember that yawp that we had back in the days with, with yeah, that was crazy, and now mm -hmm. everybody's respectable again. But, like, 
you know, yeah. he, he anything that that man says is stuff that would have ruined the political career of anyone uh, beforehand. One thing, Stormy Daniels alone. Yeah, it, I mean, but <laughs> but that was like that was what his charm was to to an extent. Like right. that's what got him to the level that he was at, and it, it was a I don't know if it was, but regardless, you know, if it's maybe it's something that's going to pass on to a lot of other people, you know. You haven't really seen anyone else other than Trump say Trump-like things in, right. in Congress or anything. So maybe it is Trump is the only one that can do it. Or maybe it is that you're going to have more... I mean, what's-his-face in Alabama that lost was probably the closest, you know, Trump analog in Congress that didn't get elected but would have been right. maybe if he, got, if he had won. But, like... You know, is it something that only Trump's going to be able to do when he's gone? It's back to West Wing style politics, or is it going to be when Trump's gone? There's just going to be another guy that fills that vacuum and just takes it and keeps the circus going. I don't know because after Perot, you had the Reform Party, and Trump was part of that. He was he was running on the Reform Party ticket in 2000, uh, and if you if you've read Mike Duncan's book about the fall of the Roman Empire. So Mike Duncan is the History of Rome podcast guy, and he wrote a book, I think it's The Shadow Before the Shadow, I think that's the title. But basically it's about the last 150 years of the Roman Republic before you get to, you know, the Triumvirate and Caesar. And he he talks about the breakdown of Mas Maiorium. Uh, Hardcore History has a new podcast out, which is like an addendum, and he's He's interviewed by uh, uh, by uh, Dan Carlin about his book, and uh, so if you don't like reading, you can go listen to that. I'll put it in the show notes. But uh, he talks about the breakdown of Mos Maiorium, where it is the breakdown of these norms, where you have in Roman society for almost a thousand years these traditions of how society operates. You have these institutions of here's here's the class system and here's this and here's that. And then the Gracchi come along, the Gracchi brothers, and completely start shredding Mos Maiorium, the those traditions, and it leads to the fall of the, the Empire within two two hundred years because they in in an effort basically to be demagogues, to gain power for themselves, violating what they knew couldn't be done in an effort to gain power for themselves. They were the, destroyed the republic. They were probably definitely not the first, but you know, early major populists. Right. Like they're, they they got much of their uh, political advancement by promising stuff to the plebes and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like that's the soldiers. That's and, what they. That's what they were all about. And yeah, and that wasn't really. There was like specific areas you were supposed to be in if you were certain classes and stuff. But, and they just, yeah, they basically said, well, we're going to use this. Here's an untapped demographic. Yep. And next thing you know, 100 years later, Julius Caesar breaks all the norms, and we know how that ended. And, and so I, I look at Trump with a lot of terror in a lot of ways because I see him, you, you read this book, and you just see a lot of the parallels. <clears throat> and uh, the, not just the, it's not Trump's fault, right? It's not the Gracchi's fault. It is the the fact that the the populations of Rome and now the populations of America had lost sight of what it meant to be a republic. Like, can we all sit here and say that people have an understanding of what it means to be a member of our society, to be a member of, of, to be a good citizen? I don't think I don't think most people do. I I think most people have no idea. It's like, just like we said, how how do you change a law at the local level? I don't know. I want the FCC to do it. Well, that's an unacceptable answer. More government to fix m- too much government is not an acceptable answer for uh, an, an American citizen, <laughs> let alone a libertarian, uh, because that's in direct opposition to the founding of this country and to the ideals of this country. And you violate those rules when you don't know what the rules are. And... And, and, like, the social contract, we go back to the social contract, yes. Th- you look at the, the, as we talked about in the last episode, chastity as an institution. Forced chastity is wrong. But there's nothing wrong with choosing chastity as a lifestyle. When you say, I'd rather get to know people on an intimate level 
emotionally as opposed to sexually. Like Aziz Ansari's first goal is to warm her up enough to sleep with her. Well, look at what the result was. You know, uh, an article in some tr trashy blog mm -hmm. that basically threatens your career. Well, if you had had if you had built some trust with the woman first and and used some of the rules uh, that we used to adhere to when it came to uh, the institution of sex and it's when you say everybody has to be chased. Well, that's not that's not cool. <laughs> people can people should be able to make the decision for themselves. Yeah, just stop telling people what to do. Man. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. but yeah. let people live their lives the way they want. But in the effort to break the norm of forced chastity, we started promoting promiscuity, which hasn't worked out for anybody. Well, maybe for Creighton, but not for Galtma. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like there are those, there are even those cultural institutions that at a certain point, like you have to start going, okay, this is why everybody's so uncomfortable is because we're changing so many political, societal, cultural, economic norms all at once in the age of the internet that everybody's going too much, too much, too much, too much. And when that happens, you get swings back and forth and you get a Trump on the, on the heels of an Obama. So then you get Bernie Sanders, and then that swings back to, like, I don't know what the... I, I don't even want to think, like, what, who's further right than Trump. <laughs> well, I mean, frankly, like, Trump's... I mean, people think of Trump, you know, do they think of conservative politics, or do they think of, like, assholery? Right. Like, I mean, yeah, you could argue that his biggest thing is immigration, and that he has a t probably a typically... Republican slash conservative immigration platform, mm -hmm. um, and and that's probably the the most political issue that comes to mind with your build the wall and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and, but I think I think when people think of him, they don't necessarily think of conservative politics. They think of his assholeness, his what, what he says, and 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 whether or not he's a closet racist, mm -hmm. uh, which comes back to what he says mostly. But like as far as like conservative, traditionally conservative political platforms, you know, I don't think, in my, from my perception, I don't think people perceive him as being that. They don't, it, it, maybe what they perceive is that he represents conservatism, and therefore all of this old stuff that was considered traditionally conservative is now, well, it must be what Trump believes. So, old-style conservatism is, well, that's what Trump is, so... I just have a hard time believing anybody who thinks, <laughs> considers Trump Ideolo ideological in any way. Yeah, I don't. I like. There's, there's nothing to me about him that screams. I've read a book. Yeah, he, he's, he's, he's first and foremost a businessman, <clears throat> and that's how he's approached everything. And and he's, he's realized his niche is to, you know, say whatever's on his mind at any given moment, and people eat it up. And frankly, he that 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 fire is fueled in a large part by the media who he knows. I mean, he's he's not the he's probably not like the most book smart president we've ever had, but he's not dumb either. He knows that when he says something on Twitter that's going to play to his base, that the left is going to throw that out there. They're going to play this, you know, on loop over and over. The left is going to get all in a huff and huff and puff about it and it's going to cause all of this stuff to have, he knows that the media eats that crap up. So, like, the left is a little bit to blame for this as well. It's like they're giving him this platform. They're, they're, you know, well, it's the president. The words of the president matters, and it's like, yeah, but he's kind of, he's kind of a different animal in that regard. Like, he doesn't choose his words carefully all of the time. So when he does say something shocking, it is shocking. He just literally just says everything all of the time. So it gives what he says less meaning, I think. Um, in a way that a normal president wouldn't be able to get away with, and wouldn't you so also they say they just makes, throw it out there. Makes what he says more genuine. Maybe I, I because he's I, not I, thinking not, about it; he's just saying it. Maybe maybe <laughs> that's, if that's your idea. I, I think, think if, that's what a lot of people see. I think that's is a lot. That he's genuine. No, I I completely agree. I do think a lot of, especially the people that support him. They they believe wholeheartedly that he's just come speaking from the heart, and they find it refreshing. And he cares about America, and he cares about our jobs, and he cares about our economy, and that's what he's going to do. And I and, and and that I completely believe that a lot of people that's what they think about him. Um, I am not convinced that he is not choosing his words carefully. I think that he is a little bit smarter than I gave him credit for in that regard. Right. And he's actually he knows what he's saying before he says it, except Kofefe. Um, well, well, I think it's uh, it's not 
I've read that it's not him that's actually typing out what he's tweeting. I mean, he's sending his thoughts over to a communications guy. I think it's Dan Scavino, and he's the one actually pushing the Twitter buttons. I mean, so there there is some there is some level. I want of, that fact checked. Uh, New York Times Maggie Haberman Glenn Thrush about two months ago that was in their article where he was sending. I mean, he probably does tweet out, but he's sending stuff to. He's literally picking up the phone and dictating to Scafino what he wants tweeted most of the time. So, uh, I I agree that I think he is more calculating than most people give him credit for. Uh, because he's manipulating the media. I think he is a genius when it comes to media manipulation and getting attention. Oh, he, he like, completely shattered every single kind of thing that involved the media from his presidential campaign onwards. Right. I mean, he has he took every, and I said this before on, on this show and just in general, that he took a lot of the wind out of the sails of many of the silencing techniques that media, particularly liberal media, has used. You know the race card, most specifically. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, it used to be if you got called a racist, then you know you had to defend yourself and you had to basically prove mm-hmm. that you weren't. Right. Um, in, in, in for you know forever, like you had to prove that you weren't before you could make any movement forward. Right. What does he do? He shows a picture of him eating a taco, and he says, taco "I bowl? Lo- yeah, taco bowl." And he says, "I love the Hispanics." On Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, like, like he like. <laughs> I mean, we laugh about that, but He's like, a troll. but the, exactly. but the, but the fact is that 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 worked. Like, uh-huh. after that, no one was like cared about it. He completely changed it, and you know, maybe he's the only one who could do that. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 but when it comes to media, yeah, he is. There's a lot to learn if you're trying to be like he is basically a shock jock president. Is yeah. what he is. I, well, he's had he's had ten thousand hours at it. I mean, this has been his whole life. He used to call the post and represent himself as his media guy. I mean, he, he, I think he is the only one that can get away with it. I think you saw Roy Moore try it, but Roy Moore is fundamentally unlikable. Yeah, but the fact you that know? he also tried to have sex with a four he did, or whatever, with a 14 or 70, or whatever right. it was, that's, I mean, not even, I mean, Trump says some weird incestuous stuff, but weird. I don't think he's ever, I don't think he's ever been like, yeah, I'd do a 14 year old. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, now you just did. Cut that. No, like, <laughs> like St- Stormy Daniels, like Stormy Daniels, nobody's even flinching at this. It's it's fascinating to me where you have this porn star who's going to well, probably tomorrow release this five thousand word story in In Touch magazine where she describes her two thousand six tryst with the president and gives graphic details about his junk and you know that but he why basically would that, why would that work if the video of him saying to that woman. Uh, the interview, like, when you're me, you can do whatever you want with girls. You can grab them. By- like, why, if that didn't work? That's that's what a lot of people on the left and in the media don't get. This kind of stuff was priced into the bo- to the purchase of Donald Trump when we elected him president right. <laughs> as a nation. Like, everybody knows he's a grotesque figure morally. Like, there's nothing about Donald Trump that I look and I go, this is a man that I want to emulate. You know, I mean, even his his children, yes, they're great, but they're also, they're, there's a weird relationship there, and from all accounts, it's very transactional. You know, and he tells Stormy Daniels, you, you're you're perfect like my daughter, you know, or some, something along those lines, weird and pervy. Like, he's, he's just a, he's a grotesque figure, and I think people are having a hard time distinguishing between Trump and the Trump administration. And I think you can look at what is coming out of the Trump administration and each policy individually and go, like this, don't like this, mm-hmm. this needs work, like this, don't like this, and while still not liking the man. Like, there's nothing about Donald Trump that I like. I laugh at him because I no longer take him seriously. He's, he, like, he's broken the most maorium. Like, in the beginning <clears throat> of the Trump stuff, that's what was outrageous to me is the threat to the breaking of the norms. But we're, we're here now. Like, you can't go back. You can't put this genie back in the bottle. Like, the... Uh, and, and what, of his, what of his policies that he's passed that make you dislike him so much as a president? I think his foreign policy is exactly like Jeff Bush. Sessions and, alone okay. is and wasn't Bush exactly. is just like Obama's? It's exactly so right. It, but so, so the status so, quo, let's, let's look at things he's done differently. Well, I think I'm a libertarian. What things has he's done differently I, that from the last president that you dislike that are, are changes from the status quo? 
Jeff says, Name one I, change I in dislike, status quo. I Jeff dislike Sessions. the status quo. I expected Donald Trump not to be status quo. So I'm a liberal. He's not. If he's I, not status if I were, quo. There's lots of things that he's done and changed. That's what I'm trying I'd to say, get at. And there's not one of them that you can name that you don't like. The, the I'm you, saying if I were if I were pro status quo, I would be a full Tommy Lauren and just say whatever dumb shit will get me will get me hits. His, Donald opposed, Trump's arguably the most libertarian president we've ever had. No, I disagree. Not ever had, yes. but in the because, modern because, era, because, yes. because, yeah. of, because okay. of his because of his actual actions are actually so, not as as not as wide and. And, you know, he says a lot of stuff, but, like, you know, Jeff Sessions is a bad, bad, Abysmal. bad. So those tax cuts were no big deal. The tax, were ref- the tax reform, but that's not him. That's, what, that was, it wasn't that's him. Been, that's he didn't been the, do it through the right channels. That's been, that's been Republican Congress has been wanting to do that since at least Reagan. Right. Um, so, and then, and so they finally did it. And, and I love it. I mean, tax cuts, all for that. Uh, the regulation thing was good. I, I'm really a big fan of that. What about the judge justices? Th- that that's that's good too for the most part. I mean, but some of the justices when he, when he are said, all these not things that we like. Yes, yes, but you, but you despise uh, the man. You see him yeah. as evil. Now listen, Galt. <laughs> if you I'm give just, us, I'm if, lost if here. You, I don't. I, if you give us a, ch- a chance, because it's not, we're going it, to agree with you let, if you just shut up. Let's also not forget <laughs> that the things that he hasn't succeeded yet on that he wants to succeed are also really, and I, and I really can't, inf- in, you know, I can't reiterate enough how bad Jeff Sessions is. But like anything that in- involves him in immigration, whenever he actually makes progress on immigration as a pot, that's going to be a nightmare. Like yeah. that's going to be a, from a libertarian perspective and just a humanitarian perspective, it's going to be the worst yeah. thing. I thought infrastructure would be bad too, but how are we paying? for it right. by the most libertarian way of funding Monopolies. infrastructure in ever all right explain. cutting aid to pakistan we're funding our infrastructure by cutting foreign aid okay. and then that's and then like the most out, libertarian answer you could have but to paying for our roads yes but then he's handing the contracts to monopolistic quote-unquote free market i mean it, it there's a lot of what trump quote you want unquote, it to be a lottery but I, hold, hold we've on, also what? only had a year. We've always done so, that, though. We've always picked co- who does our contracts. Right, but Trump is... Government's still a company. Trump's policies are traditional Republican policies because Jared Kushner is working with Paul Ryan, is working with John Kelly, is working with Mitch McConnell to get stuff done. And so a lot of what you're going to like about the Trump administration is what we would like if any other Republican had been president. And also, I'm He's not, the first president not, I've seen work with Rand Paul. I'm, I agree with that. I'm not. I'm not going to lie. But he's still going to sign Section 702 being reauthorized without Rand Paul even getting as much of a single change in it. So he, while he takes him quote unquote seriously, he doesn't do shit for him. So and I, and I, I don't feel like it's uh, off base to say that much of much of my dislike for Donald Trump comes from the people who are his avid supporters. I. I know those kinds of people, and I don't like them. Yeah, like they're bad people. No, they're not. Yes, they they're are. I have talked. I have talked to a person like a, that's an a, actual alt for someone who just an actual alt writer. Just talked alt- all about individualism. Let you're going to stand there and then generalize all Trump supporters as hate that you hate them. I don't think no, so. not all Trump supporters. I, I'm talking about specifically his most fervent supporters, the alt right style people. I have talked with them. The deplorable. Debated with them. They're not good. People. They're deplorable to you. Yes, yes, they're not good people. <laughs> they are straight up racists. I think I, I think that if you like Trump, there's a difference between Trump's base is not racist. Th- n- okay, I'm not saying he could he could not win. I will not. The pre- that. He could not. He could not have without won. racism. He could listen. <laughs> if you you want to let me finish my statement, he would not have been able to win the presidency with more than just one faction of people in this country. It's not possible. If you're going to be president, you have to have more than one group of people. Thanks for the for most you. obvious statement this, of the year. Okay. Thank my you. point is, thanks is for that, making me. My point is, is that I'm not generalizing about the entire country. I'm general or his entire base. I'm generalizing about the specific ones, and everyone knows the, the types one of people that I'm referring to. The people that didn't make one, a change in the, the election. The 18 percent of the electorate. 18 percent of the electorate the is eight, racist. No, Yes. Have you talked with somebody who is like an actual alt right person in like a one to one conversation? Yeah, about there aren't very many of them. No, that's n- that's not true. They're not eighteen percent of our country. I will right racists. I will sorry. give you the password to my Facebook, and you can have a conversation with several of these people. There, it, there are people out there, and I talked about this last time. The people that drive me nuts that would have more, they would have more credibility if at least one time they went, I don't like that. Or that was a bad, bad misstep by Donald Trump. But the MAGA people who just every single thing that Donald Trump does is 
great, and if you don't like it, you're a snowflake. Those are the people that he's talking about. Those are the people that are obnoxious. And they're just as bad as the people who are sitting there crying tears of rage because they're wearing their yeah. She Persistent t-shirt. Is that 17% too? Absolutely. I think there's absolutely... So 40%, 20... almost half of our country, of our crybabies are racists. Of the electorate. Uh, right, of the if electorate. You, if you self-identify as an alt-right person, or if I label, if I read off a bunch of alt-right positions that weren't like, use, that didn't use strong shock words, but they were like, if somebody was trying to promote themselves to somebody and they were all right, what words would they use? If I if I read that off to a person, if you support, if you're an all right person or you support those kinds of positions, then I have no problem calling you a racist. Okay. And those people voted for Trump. They didn't vote for Clinton, and they did not vote. What does they that voted have to Trump. do with Trump? I, those types of he people... He didn't call out those yeah, people. But that's not my point. Those types of people make me not like the man. That's, I... You can call that a logical fallacy, but that is a that is a reason. He's an I don't individual. Like him. You can't okay. judge him based off the actions and beliefs. You can of totally others. judge a person by the friends they keep. Those are not his friends. No, because whatever. they voted for him. That's all politics is. Is, that, who, is yeah, who, politics are you is in? getting groups of people that aren't your friends to vote for you. No, that's con- and make that, them that, believe that no, you're your friends. Re- be, <laughs> running for president is getting the spe- is getting groups who I to in, in America at least did it. is getting groups various groups of people who He's kind of agree with you to vote for you. He's a winner. Are you tired of winning yet, Galt? I'm, I mean, I know what you're doing now. <laughs> This is why people love. I just think it's. I just think that's a bit ridiculous. I, I don't at all. Wow. I, I I agree with them. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Do. I don't. I know. I mean, when when push comes to shove, everybody's defined by their own actions as individuals. But I can totally say that this if is, you have specific ideas, you may be an alt right person, and maybe you're also a, an honorable father who takes their kids to soccer practice you and, might be, and all that kind of stuff. You, you might know? be an And those, those honorable traits that, that everyone has, that's fine. But I don't have to like you because of that because you also don't like black people and think that, that, that their sub-Saharan Africans are lesser human beings. Like, they literally biologically are worse. Like, these are the kinds of things that alt-right people believe. It's not, it's old-fashioned, old-timey 1800s racism. It's not 1950s, you shouldn't sit at the lunch counter racism. It's old school stuff that they support. And, you know, I, yeah. that, 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 is enough, that is enough for me to say to you, I don't care about all your other positive traits. That trait by itself is enough that I don't like 17 you. 17% of the electorate do not believe that. I would agree that it's not 17%, but it's definitely not 1%. Let's, 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 let's split it at 9 what? <laughs> you don't. You, I mean, I don't know the no, numbers. Were you on the? Then in, he did. Were you on the internet? Did you not see how many people said, "Yeah, Haiti is a shithole because it's run by black people"? Like I saw that. Like that. And I see just there. as many people on the other side doing it too. I, I agree with you. There, two, and there are just as many people that are making logical arguments and having a real debate. Two two things can be true at the same time. I'm not saying all Republicans are like this, and I'm not saying that all you're the people who voted for Trump are this. You're saying you hate a man because of what 1% of his base voted for. And he's saying because that's they're a, all racist. That's ridiculous. And and he's I, that's saying what I'm saying. I know. He's saying it's ridiculous, too, but it's how he feels. I don't like Trump because a large portion of the people who voted for him are those types of people. It's not a minuscule percentage. I know a it's lot not, of people it's not a tri- that are It's not a trivial percentage. That's fine. But the fact that those people did it all... And that's that to me. That's a problem. I I am getting tired of him just because I'm getting tired of it all. And I, yeah, and I also am just sick of. You sound like the people that had a problem for people voting for Obama because he was black. That's the that's what you sound like to me. I. That's I. It's I the same problem. You don't like Obama because you don't like that he was elected because he was black. Yeah. That's I, because he brought out a whole group of people. I don't know if that was a substantial. That voted for him because of the what, color of his skin. And I that's don't, the only reason they voted for no, him. No, no, no. Not because of anything he believed no, in. No, no. Not because they because they believe that their race was dominant and should rule the country. That may be fine, but I don't. I think that you're overrepresenting the number of people who didn't like Obama specifically because. <laughs> but you're not overrepresenting by... the number of racist bigots in the country. No. <laughs> okay. Which is a position I've changed half on. Of them I, are felons. Which is a position <laughs> I've changed on. I think what one thing that is that is definitely um, worth mentioning is that I used to be the kind of person who's like racist. Actual racists were like a very under, very small portion of this country, and in general, people weren't. 
Um, and I still, in general, people still aren't. But but I think that the, the I have been convinced that the numbers are a lot higher than I had previously thought. I think one thing that Trump has done is allowed people who kept that stuff under their tongue to just open their mouths. Yeah. And and that's something you could say, well, that's a good thing. And I and I do think from a perspective of having it out there, it is a good thing. I like the fact that people aren't just keeping it on, you know, they're wearing their hearts on their sleeves now. I, I agree. I mean, I had a lot of friends. Uh, I, there's a lot of these libertarian brutalist groups that I was in where you... Chris Cantwell. The one percent. By the way, right. libertarian can't, brutalist groups are one percent. Alt right groups are one percent. You're just throwing out a number. I They're just nothing. <laughs> so, anyways, my point. They don't decide elections. I'm about to agree with you. If you don't, <laughs> I, if you don't shut up, if you keep talking, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm going to fight with you. <laughs> I'm about to agree with you and make your point. Um, you, you, you had a lot of these guys in these libertarian brutalism groups where. It's my free speech. It's my right to say that Jews run like make Jew jokes and anti-Semitic jokes, and I'm just kidding. And if you don't like the fact that I'm making a joke, you're a snowflake. A year later, those people were like, "Listen, everybody knows that the Jews rule the world, and we need to have a second Holocaust." Are you joking? No. Yeah. <laughs> like it was there. It, it did not free them, but it's good I mean, because then you can see their true colors. Charlottesville happened. Like, right. That that happened. That wasn't an insignificant event. But let's there go, weren't thousands of people. There. But there also wasn't right. like Give some there, there also wasn't like three dudes within a clan. It pretty up there much was sign. three dudes. There no, it wasn't thing. three dudes it, that organized it. Yes, maybe, maybe but organized. But you know, you, you know what? Three people can organize. We thousands of people came to see Gary. Yeah, but three, I, three people did that. You're gonna three people. Are you gonna sit there? We had a bigger rally listen, for Gary listen, Johnson, listen. who got one percent. Listen, are you than the, uh, than listen, the white nationalists? Listen, did. are you gonna sit at there the prime and tell me that in, in history? Their biggest prime in all of his. You know how he is. Are you gonna sit there and right. tell me that the Hold people on, who went to Charlottesville and held up torches only went because someone asked them to, not because they actually what? agreed with the sentiment? I do totally agree with Galt that we are we in the middle are caught between what seems like a very small percentage of the left and the right. But, but the, they're they're just it, really. It's really also noisy. worth mentioning in politics, extremes make a bit have a big impact. Yeah. If, that, if it wasn't true, then gay people would have absolutely no progress in this country on anything. Right. Extremes matter a lot more than they do in real life because not everybody goes out and votes. Not everybody goes and not even everybody's registered to vote. So the extremes make a big difference. So in politics, while in the general population, the amount of racists that are like. The alt right style racist may be small in the general population, but politically they are have a significant effect because they show up on the, on the way to Thanksgiving. My dad said, uh, "Yeah, I was going to get a, a, a Confederate flag." I go, "Oh, cool." What? <laughs> my dad has my dad has never been. He's not a racist. He's not somebody that is. Uh, he probably knows nothing about the Civil War. Like, we have no connection to the South. It's just that he sees the way that this small minority is being treated, and he reacts. And then his his girlfriend is like, well, I'm getting a gay flag, and we have to hang it next to it, a rainbow flag. And so she's reacting to that extreme, and then that's that's what he's talking about, is that you just get these people, everybody who just gets caught in the middle, and it's just like this terrible place to be. But I don't know that... You know, Donald, like it was happening when Obama was president, and he's a pretty mellow dude. Yeah. And then you have Trump. I mean, if you have Elizabeth Warren, it's just going to be the other way. It's never, it's not really going to stop. I mean, this identity politics is here to stay, I think. But I think if you go back to the question of is Trump a libertarian president, I would have to say fundamentally Donald Trump is not a libertarian. I don't think that Donald Trump is a conservative, I don't think that Donald Trump is anything. I think that Donald Trump is somebody who is... I, th I think this quality that has kind of shown up in the last couple of weeks and was outlined in the Michael Wolff book, that the last person that talked to him is what he believes. And I've met people <laughs> like that. It might be. You know, where literally, like in this immigration debate, it was Lindsey Graham and Dick Durbin had a deal cut with him, and then Tom Cotton got a hold of him, and then he believed what Tom Cotton said, and then Dick Durbin... Like, he literally is kind of like ping pong ball, and I think that's the scary proposition. If you're, if you are a Trump supporter, if the House and the Senate over the next few years swing the other way, mm -hmm. and he starts cutting deals, I don't think you're going to see a libertarian president. And that's what I've always maintained: is yes, you can celebrate now mm -hmm. that you have a libertarian leaning presidency in a lot of ways, in terms of economics and regulation and courts, because we do. 
We do. But what happens when the Senate is controlled by Democrats and he wants to get his nominees passed, he's going to start putting moderates on. Which is why we wanted to elect Ron or Rand, because they have principles. They have principles. And that's 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 the difference. Because you can still have libertarian policies that Trump's passed. I said most libertarian yeah. because we've never had a libertarian president. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it is... If you're saying, is he a better choice than Hillary Clinton, hmm. yeah, because Hillary Clinton, like, that's the problem with Democrats. He's a better choice than a, a very a long list of former presidents. Y- yeah, if you're talking about Hillary Clinton, who is a big government socialist, wants to invade other countries, uh, is socially left, I, I, there's nothing that I agree with her on. But, like, it, at least Donald Trump can have people who are on the right persuade him of a certain way of thinking. And you can get two regulations cut for everyone passed, and you can get Gorsuch, who was, you know, writing for Cato at one point, the Cato Institute. You can get some of these little libertarian wins, but does that mean that you're going to have a full libertarian presidency? Not at all, because no. you have you have someone who at their core is incompetent, does not have the ability to understand what the job entails and is highly persuadable. For as all the talk of him being a great deal maker, he's not. He's kind of like the 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 ping pong ball in the room if you read the reports of this immigration debate that's going on right now. Like he's not a decision maker. He's he because he doesn't understand the facts, because he doesn't have an ideology and because he's inexperienced. He doesn't he doesn't understand the mechanics of politics. Right. He understands the mechanics of business. He he has to rely on people that he trusts and those people are taking advantage of him and as a result us. And that's why why he should have never been president in the first place. Because he's he is highly persuadable because he doesn't understand what a clean bill is. Like you listen to that he doesn't understand how any of this process works. He's just being told what to do by like Mike Pence. And Mike Pence, we all know from living in Indiana, is eminently incompetent. <laughs> like, a President Pence mm. will be, uh, you'll pine for George Bush. You know what? If it turns out that any of these Democrat attacks stick and he gets impeached, I just want everybody to remember. I just impeached. want everybody to remember that a couple years ago I said in the 2016 <sighs> election, Mike Pence was the dark horse. Yeah. yeah. So he's not going to get impeached, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to read this news. <clears throat> uh, so, the, apparently there's a memo going around in Congress right now that it's, okay. it's classified, so it's not released yet, but the facts contained are jaw-dropping. Now, where are you reading this from? This What's the a, source? Oh, uh, well, this is from uh, Matt Gates, Republican of the House. Okay. This is from his congressional website, United States Congressman. Okay. Is this the, Representing uh, the, the first district laundering? of Florida. Okay. No. Um, Formerly represented by Joe Scarborough. What did you say, Creighton? There's a money laundering thing going around that I saw before I got at the gym. Yeah, yeah. The it, it, it involves... There's a couple different situations. Like, a lot of people think that Trump didn't release his tax returns because he has had investment from Russian banks. Like, Trump, in terms of businessmen, is kind of on the trashy side. Like, surprise, surprise. And those guys will a lot of times take Russian investment to buy properties, and then they will wander the money through the real estate investment, and that's why New York real estate's so high. And one of the things that they're looking at is, did the NRA take Russian money in, in some various form and then donate that to the Trump campaign? So that's where that comes from. But now he's saying, this Republican congressman is saying what? Go yeah, on. that there's a four-page memo circulating Congress right now that shows the government, the FBI, and the Department of Justice's surveillance abuses. And it's, sh- it's quote, shocking, troubling, and disturbing. They're say- he's saying uh, part of him wishes he didn't read it, mm-hmm. and that there's no higher priority than to release this to preserve our democracy. Yee. Which, hyperbole from a congressman is like getting shit from a horse. So, but still. No, I mean... I wouldn't. I mean, it'd be shocking if it wasn't shocking. It's kind of like when Massey said, "Though this, the the, the world will never uh, recover from the redacted pages of the 9/11 report," and then it just told us what we already knew. <laughs> Nobody really cared that Saudi Arabia was involved in 9/11. Like, mm-hmm. so 
So they're saying this is going to make, they're going to drop the Mueller investigation. It's going to blow it wide open. It's all over. Even if it's true or not, the Republicans will use that as leverage. Like, yeah, Trump's, it's Trump's clean. But see, here's part of the, this well, goes back to. as clean as you can be. This is what <laughs> goes back to Trump not being prepared for the job, where he tweets in, the, in an afternoon, you know, this FISA reauthorization bill is lousy because that's what they use to spy on me. And then two hours later is saying, get smart, we need to sign this bill and get 702 passed. And it's uh, it's laughable because you can't, he, he's saying two things. He clearly doesn't understand the process. And FISA 702 was passed by the House and the Senate. And essentially what Section 702 of the FISA bill is, it was passed in 2008. And essentially it isn't the part that collects all the data. It isn't the part that authorizes all the data collection. It, it creates a system for uh, checking various databases to access all the data that's collected. So the government claims that they only collect metadata. Metadata that's absolutely false. They collect, especially overseas, every type of content, and they put it into you know NSA databases where uh, the various agencies, the 17 intelligence agencies, access this data. And what 702 does, it's, it's sunsetted for six years now, according to the bill that Trump will inevitably sign. And it's it sunset as part of the check and balance. And the intelligence community has said this is 25% of everything we know about terrorists. It's the crown jewel of how we track terrorist movement. Yes, we understand that American data sometimes gets caught in these searches, uh, but... We, we we do what we can. <laughs> and so here, here's the philosophical question. Do you think that the government should be collecting all of the information or not? And then how do you want them to operate with that information? Uh, in, in all my research, I can tell you that uh, they seem to have a fairly stringent process of checking the data. So for instance, uh, someone shoots up a Turkish nightclub. This is an example that they that was given on the Lawfare podcast. One of the FBI agents talking about it. This guy shoots up uh, a nightclub. We get his identity. We go in. We do an about search. We put in his name. We then find a wealth of information based on all of the data that is collected through all of the collection that we do. And then we can start tracking different hops, different connections. So, you know, they find his email, and they read through his email, and then they go to his cell phone, and they go to, through videos, and they find various uh, connections. How, why did he make this decision? And when you do these uh, about searches, you inevitably find Americans. Because let's say we're doing show prep for Section 702, and Chris Galt is in London, and... You know, or Glenn Greenwald, who's in Brazil, and I are, are communicating about Section 702, and I'm getting information from him for my podcast, and Galt is on the email in London. Because they're overseas, they have the, the legal authority to collect all of that data. And even though we are American citizens, and I'm an American citizen, they, if they're targeting Glenn Greenwald and watching him, then my data is caught up. They don't need a warrant to read that email, which libertarians fundamentally believe is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. You must get a warrant before you search the data of any American citizen. F Section 702 says that uh, they don't need a warrant, and the government argues that it's a reasonable search. We don't just go through people's data looking for crimes, which by all accounts and all the research I did is true. But we're taking their word. But they have to provide no evidence of. Well, and, so and it all goes through so, a secret court. No, so here's how. So let's say we have a terrorist suspect. Okay, we're the we're F, you're an FBI agent, you're in the CIA, and I'm in the NSA, and we have uh, uh, one of the Sarnayev brothers. Mm -hmm. They were turned down for the Sarnayev brothers because they were American citizens or they were Americans under whatever the laws that they've crafted in these courts. So, like, they couldn't go and look at all the searches that the Sarnayev brothers were Googling because they were in America. But when they were overseas in Russia, 
than they could there, okay? So you and I have a terrorist suspect. What you have to do is you have to write up a report, which Michael Hayden, um, and I've, I've posted all these videos and a bunch of different links and stuff at walpolitics.com. There was a great debate between one of the Snowden journalists from the Washington Post and Michael Hayden. It's about two hours long where they're basically going back and forth about this program. Really interesting. And so Michael Hayden says, what you have to give to the FISA court is about the size of the Cincinnati phone book. And it has to be extremely detailed why you're getting this information, what you're going to use it for, why are they being targeted. And it goes to a FISA judge who's appointed by the Chief Justice. These FISA courts are across the nation. And yes, it's all secret, so they say if it were public, then, you know, ISIS could watch who was getting uh, searched or not. So we need, we need privacy in these searches. And the judge, they, they almost never reject any of these because one of the criticisms is they're never rejected. Well, Hayden says it's more of a working process, and so if they aren't going to approve it, they'd say, here's what you need to change. Which, good or bad, that's the process. I mean, you can look at that and go, well, the check and balance is the secret judge, and they're acting as a buddy-buddy buddy. Buddy, buddy friend mm -hmm. when the very criticism of these FISA courts is that there is no check or balance. There isn't anybody saying, no, you can't do this. And so one of the thoughts is that Michael, um, uh, the, the NSA director that lied to the FBI that, that got fired, Michael Flynn, mm -hmm. he was working with Turks and consulting with them, he was working with Russians, he was being targeted through some of these programs to see what he was doing, even though he was an American citizen. Um, he was working with foreign governments and they were claiming to monitor the other side of the call and the Kislyak calls, mm -hmm. and then that information was used for political purposes. Which, all of this is what libertarians have been saying, we were saying in 2012. You, you, you say now this is only used for Muslims in Yemen, but what happens 20 years down the road when we're using it for political purposes? And that's, that's where we're already getting, you know, four years, yep. uh, we eight have years down the road. Been, we just haven't known about it. We, we haven't know, known about it. We're not learning about it. It's the fundamental, right. uh, the fundamental libertarian <laughs> that everybody always gives us crap for, for, for using the zones, but it's the... It's it's the danger of power. Right. It's like, you know, this is a power. Well, we're using it. We're using it well. Like it's not always going to be used well. Right. And once you've made it's, you know, the free speech argument. Like you you censor one speech that you don't like. You've given free reign to censor any kind of speech. You know, if you give the government a power to do this, even though they may be doing it well now in its infancy or whatever, you know, it, it's only a matter of time. It really is only a matter of time before it gets abused. Yeah. It, it's, it, it will happen. There's nothing that you're going to be able to do to stop it from happening except getting rid of the power. And Admiral Rogers, who is head of the NSA's Section 702 program, was speaking at the Heritage Foundation, and he's like, listen, we take, we tell on ourselves. Whenever we make a mistake, we tell, you know, oversight committees, we tell judges, we tell, we have this whole process of when we do something wrong, it's like, okay, well, you seem trustworthy. You seem like a trustworthy guy, and you seem honorable, but so do Michael Flynn. And it turns out he's a total liar. He's a total dirtbag. You know, and just because you have the, just because you make transparency a priority, and, and, and what they all argue from the FBI to the CIA to the NSA is that transparency is a priority because this is such a, 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 a like I said, they've said, this is the crown jewel. This is where they get the most of their information. This is the thing that is keeping America... This is the thing that has kept America from getting attacked again, is what they say. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to jeopardize the tool. So the incentive of transparency with, within the regime that they've set up, of checks and balances, they follow to the T because they don't want to jeopardize the tool. Because they know they're under such scrutiny that they could have it canceled at any moment which I find to be a, value, a valid argument, but still, there isn't... There isn't a, Where's the authority? The, Who, where does the authority come from for this? The authority was just written by the Bush administration and, and put... It was started under the Patriot Act, and then... Ah, the, yeah. so, so they were... They, were co they started collecting all of this information, the Patriot Act, which was yeah, partially written by Vice <laughs> President Pence, uh, 
So the Patriot Act outlined all this. Did we, did we, when do we get to say we told you so? Right. <laughs> Not now. Like, <laughs> and so they ha they started collecting all the metadata under PRISM and all mm -hmm. the stuff that Snowden exposed. And they were having a tough time actually going through the data because now they have uh, the haystack gets too big. And so right. it was Plantier, I think it's Plantier Technologies, which is owned by Peter Thiel, started by Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. great libertarian hope that he is, co-founder of PayPal, investor in Lyft, advisor to Trump, uh, gawker killer. <laughs> uh, you know, he started this company with uh, an investment from InQtel, which is the seed company from the CIA. And so Plantier Technologies basically went through and created the ability to go and search all of this metadata. So you have people who are hackers uh, who work in Silicon Valley who are 24. Who have access to all this who data. Who have access to literally all this data. And so there's... In my eyes, illegal data. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're literally every email. This podcast is on an NSA, CIA... U.S. Th thing. Creighton Spears have come true. His name's on a list. <laughs> so he tried so hard. They have offshore of Britain, Europe. Basically said, uh, "Hey, are you going through all our stuff?" And we were like, "Nah." And then it came out that we were like spying on Merkel and all of her email. And so uh, a, a collaboration was set up, and we had this big NSA thing off the off of England that basically collects everything over on that side of the Atlantic. So it's it's really robust, but Trump was against it before he was for it. Now he's going to sign it. And uh, yeah, have you seen Trump versus Trump on Reddit? No, no it's, but it's just him it's contradicting like, himself yeah, over and over again. It's like Ben Shapiro. <laughs> ben Shapiro every day has good Trump. Because when you Trump. don't have principles, that's what you do. You make decisions on a whim for right. for a gain, for economic gain or political gain or something. Right. As long as you're getting something out of it. That it can change your, your, your mind. I think never, an important thing to, to point out about this this issue um, is that this does split, or this does not split on party lines. Like it, it, there are groups within both parties that support it and are against it. And I think if anyone, yeah, yeah. if if anyone is trying to say, here's another reason that Trump's bad is because he supports this. Like you know, here's another reason Republicans are bad because they support this. Like that, that's that's this on this issue in particular. That's an unfair critique. Um, I mean, you don't have to go any further than Ron Wyden and Rand Paul and, and the other senators. I think it was three Democrats, two Republicans that uh, put forth the amendment that did not pass that would have required a warrant mm -hmm. to get all of this information. And then Justin Amash had the same. And I don't know who else co sponsored in the house. Which their argument is that it will take too long. Like, you're talking about maybe less than 24 hours. It's like, well, it's life and death. Well, we don't know that for sure because you're not giving us proof that that's the case. Right. And and these 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 amendments were pushed by... Uh, I would argue that the Amash amendment was probably his baby. and Because mm. the last time that they tried this, he also put forth an amendment to make there be a warrant and only failed by, like, what, 10 votes or mm -hmm. something like that? Really close. Um, and... The, these, uh, so on that, on, on, in the House, I would say that the Republican, a Republican, is the strongest voice for uh, for getting that amendment passed. In the Senate, it's probably more more even. But the point, my, the point I'm trying to make is that the leadership of both parties um, are the ones that got this pushed through without the amendment. Um, Nancy Pelosi, in particular, made it a point to to make sure that the enough Democrat votes were whipped to make the amendment fail. Um, so, on, on this issue, it, it's important to take to take a perspective that cannot be partisan because it is not partisan. Um, it is it is an authoritarian versus anti-authoritarian uh, split, and and I think it's important when you're judging this issue, you have to you have to bear that in mind. And you know, for our listeners, that's probably not a problem. Like we judge everything, you know, whether and we don't care what party you're part of. We just kind of look at where you're right. following the issue. But uh, that's not true in general, especially not nowadays with, with the general population. It is interesting to see people who, who like Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi, who think he's literal Hitler. Donald Trump is literal Hitler, but we should give him the ability to spy on Americans without a warrant. <laughs> like, 
If you really believe that, wouldn't you not vote for this? Wouldn't you do everything you possibly can to stall the tyrant, the the dictator Trump, from having these powers? Like, so either you don't believe what you're saying and that he's a he's a literal dictator, or and you're just being hyperbolic, or you want the powers yourself, which those are two troubling instincts. Yeah, and, and th- that argument, you would hope that argument would work, but if it didn't work when we were talking about, eh, that may not be fair, but if it didn't work when uh, we are talking about Obama getting certain authorities... Yeah. No, we made the same argument. We the did. Same we did. One. We yeah. made the same <laughs> argument, and then, you know, it got brushed off, and now, like, well, if it didn't work then, why would it work now? It's like, oh, you know, you don't... And, and, it's, and it's, I, I want to say vindicating um, that, at least in the past year, how many times on Reddit, but just in general, I've seen, you know, these are look at look at Trump doing this and this, and like you know, that's something that Obama did. Yeah. Like you know, we warn you, if, you know, yeah. you're gonna get a president you don't like. He's gonna have these same powers, right. and you know, it's just, it does it, people because again, people don't think long term about this stuff. They think about the immediate effects, and that's it. It stops there. They don't look Man. at ripples. It's titled this episode. I told you so. I can't wait for <laughs> for five years from now when we are uh, to again uh, again together. Yeah, we'll and do we're it ta- again. talking about the president, the Rock. Yeah, and we'll uh, be making the same mistakes, and we'll be saying the same <laughs> things five years from now, and then uh, Malia Obama. After that, five years down that road, right. <laughs> so. Uh, and Gates, uh, uh, Gates said that uh, the Trump investigation is a sham. It's a sham. It's After a... reading that memo. Um, Christy Avery wants us to end the show, so we're going to give her her wish. We're going to start wrapping up. So we've got wrap Why? up, so we've got another hour. Then. Creighton Rap- talked too Rap- much. Rap- Bored Christy, she's falling asleep. The, see, <laughs> Gal- see, this is what... All right. <laughs> I want to have Galt on more often because Galt is radio gold because he's just combative and creates drama wherever he goes. But I also have to think about the other co-hosts. Yeah, you got to <laughs> think about your show. Don't worry about the co-hosts; they'll make it back. <laughs> I'll stay here all night. The show loves yeah, I, the I drama. Don't, I don't, well, I don't have anything to do more. You guys are you, you're going uh, east, mm-hmm. so you guys want to come back next Thursday? Yeah. Are you available? Uh, as of right now, yeah. All right. Well, if you find anything better to do, <laughs> no, I won't. I, I, I it's still, like, I, I'm I, still swiping right on Tinder. No, I, I think <laughs> I'm finishing up working my part time job to make sure I can pay the last round of bills before I leave. So yeah, I, left I don't have that schedule yet for Thursday, but probably will be free. Life is about to get real busy, real expensive. Yeah. Mm. You, you want to talk about what you're doing? I just I'm going to work for a uh, software engineer in New York City. Ah, very good. New York City. Yeah. Where, where are you going to live? Do you know? Uh, it's working on it right now. Uh, so, But in Manhattan, more than likely. Did you ever think you'd live in a place more expensive than Alexandria, Virginia? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is way more expensive than Alexandria, Virginia. So we're excited to have a New York City correspondent. Yeah. Uh, it's we nice. said that we said that for the DC when I went out to DC and then I only had like one episode. Yeah. When I was yeah. out there. <laughs> well, we skyped you in, but you're you a you were still like you weren't immature. You just didn't care. Like you still don't. <laughs> he still care. doesn't care. <laughs> but at least you're like more grown up. So like you pretend better. Yeah. That you don't care. Uh, you never really cared. all the world's a stage. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's start. Let's start wrapping up. Final thoughts, Chris. Gold. Uh I don't know. I'll, we'll do this again next week. Oh wait, wait, wait! No, send us some. So yeah, send some stuff in. That wait, you want us I do. To we do have an important topic that we need week. to talk about. Chris what? Bangle has watched all of the Star Wars. What did you think? Oh. That's right. I have now consumed all, all of them. All of the. Did Star you see Wars. the Last Jedi as well? No, oh, not dude. yet. God. So wh- I watched Rogue One because I saw it on Netflix, and I was like, you know what? I, I had I had seen the, I had seen two of the first three as a kid. I think. I remember seeing the the first and the third. You so, have to remember Pod Racing. So, so yeah, so I saw the first and third as in episode one and three, I or saw, episode four. No, and seven, I saw A New six. Hope and Return of the Jedi oh, because okay. I remember four and six. Then yeah. I remember the okay. little Wookies, the little uh, the Ewoks, the Ewoks, Wookies. <laughs> uh, but I don't remember Empire Strikes Back at all. That was all very new to me, so hmm. I had a vague recollection of the third one. So I really had never watched any of them, 
So I started at Phantom... He's over 30, by the way. So I watched Phantom Menace, or I watched Rogue One on Netflix. I was like, yeah, I'll try it out. This is probably about a month ago. And I, I, uh, I'm going to have to watch it again now that I know what's going on, because yeah. it, it didn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, I told you, you can't start I with didn't episode know you one. Didn't, right. You have to start now, at four. <laughs> and you ranked it already. Uh, so And I, I combated you about that movie. And it's because you haven't rewatched it since. It, it was good. You need to watch it again. Here's what I liked about Rogue One, is that it was exciting and kept my attention. Like, there was fighting in it, so it, it was good. But you didn't get the story. I got most of the story. Because it two trilogies you'd never seen. Having been a libertarian <laughs> for over ten years now, I know enough of the Star Wars <laughs> mythology to, like, get the whole thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, the little Wookiees. The little Wookiees. And so... Then I started with Phantom Menace because it was on uh, Hulu, and so I watched uh, the first. I started at Phantom Menace, and that was mm, that was an abortion. <laughs> it's not, that was not good. Yeah, that it's, was. Uh, it's not, and it's it's sad because there's so much potential. But it's one of those ones. I've, if, there's actually documentaries about uh, the, the making of that movie and. Um, how when George Lucas watched the final cut, like after they had gotten together, he sat down and he watched it. At the end, he's like, "Wow." Did some stuff there that uh, I don't know how that's going to play. Like it was like he, even he was like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> it was one of those things. Like you get to a certain point, you're like, "This is going to work. It's going to work." And then you got, get it all shot. You get it together. You're like, uh, "Well, you can't go back now and do yeah. it." Yeah. Well, here's the the prequels all look like they were shot on Star Trek Voyager. Like they all just had that like nineties. To be fake fair, look. Episode three is amazing. It uh, oh, Revenge of the Sith is amazing. It's a really good yes. movie, and and so I I didn't like Phantom Menace, but it it didn't really hold my attention. Uh, Attack of the Clones was good. There was some fighting in it. The storyline was okay. Uh, then the Revenge of the Sith I thought was really good because there was a lot of political drama in it, and so that got mm-hmm. me. That that's got me that's, that's and to me that's what holds the 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 original the prequel trilogy from being total garbage right. is that there is this overarching political like you know Palpatine's rise in the shadows yes. like that stuff I I like that it happens in one it happens in two right. and it obviously happens yeah. in three and it keeps me what what makes the first two really bad is the acting yes. and in times the dialogue like George Lucas is it, not the greatest at dialogue but Jar Jar Binks, uh, Awful. Hayden Christensen, hey. these these guys, they just weren't the greatest of actors. And Jar Jar was just for kids. And yeah. that that that's what really bring, bogs it down. But like if you can get past that and look at it from a different look beyond that, there is some stuff in there that's worth liking. I, Liam Neeson, I love Liam Neeson's was character. Oh. I thought I thought the first three, the the prequels were gonna be way worse than they actually were. Yeah. So because I just heard so bad because I, oh, it's all, you know, yeah because I'd heard they're not they're not as bad as no one hates Star Wars as much as Star Wars fans <laughs> right and I've heard I've heard nothing but trash about all these movies even the new ones you hear the right. everybody hates the new ones and, and so, they're not bad so I watched uh, I watched uh, a New Hope great Empire Strikes Back not bad I I think Return of the Jedi is my favorite uh, and Empire mm. Strikes Back was second then A New Hope third. Mm. Uh, maybe th- it's a tight race on third and fourth between uh, the the newest, the first new one, where Force Han Solo awakens, Wiggins, where Han Solo dies. That's your favorite or your third favorite? F- uh, I'm gonna go four on that. No, 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 no. Okay, here we go. Revenge, Revenge of the Jedi. Revenge, Revenge, Revenge of the, the Jedi. Jedi. Revenge of the Sith. No, no, no. Return right. of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Okay. Empire Strikes Back. It's like pulling teeth. Revenge of the Sith. Then uh, New Hope, and then uh, yeah, the what's the first one? A Force Awakens. Phantom Menace. The four, no, the, the Force fu- Awakens is is the seventh one. <laughs> right. And then we've got um, <laughs> then we've got uh, Attack of the Clones. Uh-huh. Rogue One. Oh. Rogue One is. You probably, thought Rogue, Rogue One was worse. Rogue than One's Attack? better than Attack of the Clones. Okay. <laughs> Fanta, I know my favorite was Return of the Jedi because it was there was a lot of action. There was like, I don't know the part where there. I, I, I guess I watched the supercut because I got it from the library and they're all cheering because they all won. Oh, the ninety seven reason won. And like that, that, that was. I, I'm sentimental. I'm like, yay! Yeah, we might win. They over, a happier ending. We might end over globalists. <laughs> 
Uh, but I re- but then I saw Hayden Christensen in him. And I'm like, yeah, that's what the, the fuck's going on here? Okay, that was the the DVD, the Blu-ray we released. Yeah, that, that wasn't originally Hayden Christensen. That was the guy who, the actor who played Darth. Oh, okay. And they, they they superimposed Hayden Christensen. Well, I knew that had to be the case because that's when I knew something <laughs> fishy was up because I didn't know it had been redone. It was until totally that. unnecessary too. Right. Like there's there's this debate about changes that George Lucas made that helped it. And then changes that hurt it. Right. And but that change it hurts it because it's completely unnecessary. It completely threw like, me why out. Why would the, why would like after thirty years he still look like Hayden Christensen? Right. <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense. It because he's not alive. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he's a freaking robot anyway. Like it was such a great moment, and then it threw me out of it completely. Yeah. Scared. It was like yeah. it was just it was unnecessary. Like put in the, get the actor from Game of Thrones who's the the bald eunuch. Uh, there is. Paris, Here, because he looks just like he looks just like uh, Darth Vader when he dies. Oh wow! Um, the worst was definitely Phantom Menace. Uh, I haven't seen Last Jedi. Watch yeah. Rogue One again. That's I, probably I my yeah. top three. I, I like Rogue One. One's in my top three. Not, I think Rogue One, to a lot of people that I've I've interacted with, is overrated. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. It's definitely better than. You know, Phantom Menace and Attack the Clones. I liked it much better than Force Awakens. It, but but it was I, a, I didn't like how... I, what My problem with, with Rogue One was, by the end of it, I didn't care about the characters like I should have. I, I can't tell you any one of the characters. Like, like I don't remember any of I them. Just, I mean, like, it's, it's a it, forgettable... That being, said, that being said, the battles, the large-scale battle yes. scene in that is the best of any of them. Man, movies. I yes. shed tears on that beach scene. That but was a great beach scene. The, I oh, I cared. I didn't care about the main. Especially when Matt Damon. I'm sorry. Let me say it. I didn't care about the main. And Tom Hanks was taking care of him. Oh, okay. The main two <laughs> characters. I didn't care about the the leads. Right. I uh, I honestly cared more about uh, what's his face, the general that died. Like I cared more about him. Right. I thought he was awesome. Obviously, the Darth Vader scenes were fantastic, uh, and that was just there. I mean, that's just always gonna be great. <laughs> um, but like honestly, what tore me up the most uh, as far as characters dying was the 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 uh, Donnie Yen and his friend that were at the temple uh, of the uh, the Kyber Crystal Temple. Uh-huh. Like when they died on the beach, I was like, oh man, they're yeah. all. But like when what's her face or, or Jalen or Ursa or whatever when she dies, I didn't really care. I, I don't I don't bit. remember any of the people you're talking about, and and so like to me that makes it a lower movie. It's just that I don't. Really, I kind of have a vague awareness of it, of the plot, but I I remember enjoying it and it keeping my attention. Like I'm so ADD that, and I'm always doing two other things. Like I'm watching TV while I'm on a device while I'm reading. You miss a lot of details. Always. And how many times have you watched Game of Thrones? Uh, I tried when it first came out, and there was too many characters, and week to week it was too hard, and so I went back and rewatched it. Uh, a year ago in in a binge form and that was that's when I was like this is fantastic you it's a show for binging like if you're trying to keep up week to week yeah like that, forget it that's it is it is definitely one of those so but yeah like revenge revenge of the sith and uh, return of the jedi were the only two where i put everything down i was like holy shit and in uh and the new one with uh, Force Awakens, yeah, Force Awakens. Yeah, I, you yeah. should see Last Jedi. Uh, yes, I'm interested to see where where you fall in it. I liked it. Yeah. To all Me of too. the to all of the the listeners, Star Wars fan listeners, I am pro Last Jedi. Yep. Um, I thought I thought it was good. It's definitely I think one of those ones that in ten years or whatever, uh, after all of the dust has settled and people kind of accept it as being a movie that's that's happened, <laughs> it's gonna because like right now they're like. Oh, well, like, this, this third no, trilogy doesn't count. Yeah, like, it doesn't there, count. Like, there's plenty. Of, there's people out there. And listen, uh, criticism. There was no third Matrix. There's many different. <laughs> th- there's a. I wish I could remember. It's like the seven hats or the six hats, and it's a business book, and it's like every team needs these hats, these seven hats, and there's a blue hat who's positivity, and the green hat who's innovation, and the white hat who's optimism or like all these different hats and then there's that white hat's not great and then there's the black hat who is always negative always critical and everybody wears the black hat because it's so critical like it's so easy to be critical and so mm-hmm. like when i see people just constantly being negative about stuff like something like star wars i go it's easy to constantly hate star wars or constantly hate anything that's new or constantly hate that's hate donald trump it's like 
if you're always positive about Donald Trump and he never has done anything that you disagree with, then you're not an you're not a valid word. You're not a valid person to listen to. Yeah, you're a racist. Yeah, right. If you to Crane. probably, and then if you like, I love the original three, but everything else sucks. <laughs> it's like that's then you're just not to be listened to. Like right. nobody likes you. You're probably a terrible person. Stop. To me, to me, I'd say. <laughs> I, honestly, I say my top is a tie between New Hope and Empire. That's my I, I am comfortable saying that that's a tie. Um, I honestly like Revenge of the Sith more than Return of the Jedi, um, so that's probably my number three. Um, and then probably Force Awakens. I don't know Last Jedi. I don't know where that would be yet. I like Last Jedi, though. I, I'm one of those guys. I think it's going to be considered one of the more important ones when, at, at, at the end of the day, people are going to be like, this is one of the most important Star Wars. And, and honestly, and to all of those who are watching who have only seen Last Jedi once, go see it again and watch it without all of the... with, with understanding the surprises that happen yeah. in the movie. Watch it again, and I think you'll like it more. I loved how instead, like all the previous Star Wars movies have always been light and dark was the theme, right? Right, Spangler? Right. It's like good and evil, right? Yeah, but it's Joseph Campbell's uh, Man with a Thousand Faces. The new movie touches on neutrality, the, that neutral. Okay. And I, and I, li I like that they dove into that the real gray deep. area. The, yeah. On both sides, the neutral. Because that's and, where you start to build complexity in the story. Mm hmm. So there's a book by uh, Christopher Booker called The Seven Basic Plots, where it's just basically the seven plots of all of history. Joseph Campbell and, and uh, who's the, the Kermit guy? Uh, Jordan Peterson kind of talks about this a lot, too, the archetypes. You know, so story really can be distilled down to several parts. So you, you always have these basic formulas, and if you can break formula in a really creative way and kind of get into that gray area as opposed to, you know, Luke versus Darth. It's it's when Darth starts to get conflicted between Palpatine and Luke in Revenge and uh, Return of the Jedi. That's what made it so great is because that complication to the basic storyline. That's when you go, ooh, yeah. all right, there's something. The, redem the redemption of the father through the son Cause it, motif. Well, because everybody's everybody has that within them. Everybody, it, people aren't inherently like Donald Trump is not good or bad. Like, there are parts of him that are good, and parts of that, him that are bad, and there are parts of him that just are nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and nobody has that, that ability to do critical thinking anymore. Uh, <laughs> the, the book is Six Thinking Hats. There's the white hat, neutral and objective, concerned with facts and figures. Red hat, the emotional view. Black hat, careful and cautious, the devil's advocate hat. Yellow hat, sunny and positive. Green hat, associated with fertile growth, creativity, and new ideas. Cool, B blue hat, cool, the color of the sky above everything I'll take else. the green hat. Uh, I have some great new ideas about some show ideas. All right. Ooh, you guys don't um, hear it. Have, do I do. You, <laughs> do you watch uh, Rick and Morty? Uh, I've started the first one. Um, months ago. I think you like, episode? if, you, if yeah. you like Joseph Campbell, <laughs> uh -huh. you'd like that show. because Dan, seen Community? Because Dan Harmon, the guy who, uh, yeah. one of the writers, yeah. he... Uh, he has he calls it the store the the story circle, where he has basically just he's basically put the Joseph Campbell monomyth kind of idea mm -hmm. into a nice clean little circle where like here's phase one phase two phase three and he does it every single episode yeah. of Rick and except Morty. for one except for the one that he doesn't like the Vindicators uh, yeah the Vindicators <laughs> he, hates that, he hates that episode because he doesn't follow his but every, every single episode follows the story circle yeah. interesting I'll, I'll check it out I've heard a lot have of have you seen Community the show I didn't like Community oh, it's the same guy yeah. Yeah. so you probably won't like, like Rick and Morty well it's not ju it's Justin Roiland as well and Justin Roiland's input is very very prominent in the show the people that I th agree with their content choices like Rick and Morty people that I don't usually like Community so maybe well, I, I like those. They're the same thing. One right, is with really? real people, one's with cartoons. Okay. Rick and Morty's like they, Rick and they pull, better, though. They pull characters straight from Community and digitize them into Rick and Morty. <laughs> I would argue that... Beth I, is the same person from Community. I would argue that like, Rick and Morty <laughs> tries to be a little bit more philosophical than Community does. I think Community plays on pop culture a lot more than Rick and Morty does. Uh, Rick and Morty tries... They, I mean, literally, like, there's like full-fledged like hour-long YouTube videos about people just... just, just 
breaking down the existentialist philosophy. I stuff. don't. I don't remember Community talking about Szechuan sauce. I'd say Rick and Morty's very big in pop culture. I'm not oh. saying that Rick and Morty doesn't reference <laughs> pop culture. Good God. <laughs> I'm saying that re- that can we, six can years, we end the episode real quick? Six years and it's all the same. Are you gonna punch him? Good yes, I need to get in this headset. Regardless, off. my point my point is. Oh, uh, so Rick and Morty tries to have more in depth philosophical stuff in it while doing it as a cartoon about a crazy mad scientist grandpa. So, all right, final thoughts, Chris Gall. Yeah. I'm ready to go. That is <laughs> that is the most perfect final thought ever. I'm ready to go. Uh, <laughs> you used to end in like this really long quote from Jefferson and Washington. <laughs> I don't know. You used to quote the Fear is what is Do you is, still have the Fear is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. There you go. Ben Franklin quote. Didn't you have the emancipation memorized? No. What was it? Not the preamble, the, the declar- something else. The declaration of independence. Yeah, say it for us. No. That can be your final words. All right, so thanks for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. I want to thank our $100 a month Patreon subscribers. You get your name read on every show. Brandon Luke, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, and the lovely Christy Avery, who will be on, well, maybe, will be on another episode of uh, Miranda's World, one of our podcasts. We have a lot of new podcasts uh, out there in the world. Uh, Go to wearelibertarians.com. You can see all of our other shows. Uh, If you want to learn how to podcast, The Chris Spangle Show... If you want to uh, learn about what it's like to live as a stripper, Miranda, Miranda's World, uh, The Brian Nichols Show, brand new show. I think if you like this show, you will love The Brian Nichols Show, so check that out. Um, and we will be back next Tuesday. Also, if, you're, if you uh, want to join the Patreon, it's patreon.com slash libertarians, And $5 a month or up, and you get access to all the bonus content, including Harry's weekly show. Uh, there's going to be... The, you got an extra 30 minutes of the last episode. You always hear the beginning and the end. There's always... Uh, I leave the recorder running at the beginning of the show, so you hear all the, the pre-talk. Higher quality, no commercials. It's such a great deal. $10, you get access to the private Facebook group. You can uh, chat with listeners while we live stream the show. You can watch it live. And then 25 you get uh, two posters, one of them signed. And then $100 a month, you get to come on the show. We're working with Jason Doolittle. He's actually going to fly out and be on the show. I need to talk to Craig and Brandon about coming on. And uh, Craig, I do, I do have a final thought. Yes, Stop eating Tide Pods, you freaking idiots. No, no, no. I <laughs> disagree. Eat Tide Pods. It'll work out for everybody in the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us here on this episode. And until Tuesday of next week, we say be good to each other. Oh, we changed the sign off? Well, I mean, we can do it together.